Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you, if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Dr. Gary Crotaz. Gary is an executive and mindset coach, author of The Idea Mindset. He is the host of the Unlock Moment podcast and a member of the Forbes Coaches Council. Um, and as you will find out today, Gary's done about three people's worth of um, things in his <laughs> which I loved already hearing about before we started recording. Welcome to the podcast. 
Jono, thanks so much for inviting me on. And it's, it's uh, delightful to, to be talking to you from the other side of the world. Yeah, it is wonderful. With people on, on the other side of the world. Before you explain um, what you do, I just have to say I'm still, uh, I am still recovering from the fact that just the, just the fact that you are not just Dr. Gary Crotaz, as in a uh, uh, PhD, PhD, but actually uh, who then <laughs> transitioned into business. And that your story already has blown my mind. Um, and we're going to find out a bit more about that um, as we chat about your story. But um, tell us what you do at the moment, the different hats you wear, and, and just a bit of a thing right now, Gary. Sure. So um, I've always had a thread running through my whole career, a sort of mission thread of making a difference. And, and the way I apply it now is in this career where I, I uh, am a coach, an executive coach, uh, and I work with senior executives in business. I work with entrepreneurs. I work with artists and performers as well. And, and I do quite a lot of work with ultra high net worth families. Uh, I also do some writing. So I published my book, The Idea Mindset. Uh, in January, which is a, a, a sort of self-reflection book about how to figure out what you want and how to get it, particularly in a career context, but you can apply it more broadly. I started podcasting earlier this year as well. Uh, so I, I host the Unlock Moment podcast, which is a long form interview podcast where I'm uh, interviewing lots of people from my network, people I've coached before, senior executives around remarkable moments of change, remarkable moments of clarity, in their life and career. Uh, and I've got an emerging kind of speaking practice. I'm looking this year to get more into doing uh, events and, 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 and speaking uh, gigs as well. Yeah. Wow. Love it. Love the approach. There's a bit of a, a bit of crossover actually with your approach with what I do. And, and I, I just love the remarkable moments. It's a great way to position your podcast. I can see why, um, you know, that automatically makes me want to listen. So I really encourage people to podcast and and your book and um yeah already uh, already great to to get to know you a bit but let's jump into your story gary uh i'd love to start with your childhood and growing up moments from that season of your life that really shaped you into the person and the leader you are today that's a great question so uh it probably starts uh, at the age of four years old uh, which was when I was first sent to ballroom dancing classes by my parents. I have two older brothers who dance. Um, and so I, I, I went to my first dance classes when I was four. Um, and, you know, whilst I was at school, um, it was the thing that, you know, we would do in the evenings or weekends. And eventually I started going to little ballroom dancing competitions. I was one of those cute little kids in a, in a white shirt and a black bow tie. Uh, and I carried on ballroom dancing all the way through to when I went to university, and when I went to university, I studied medicine. So as you talked about before, uh, I, when I was 17, um, I, that, that's what I wanted to do as a career. I wanted to train as a doctor and practice as a doctor. And I actually spent eight years in medical school. Uh, I spent uh, the first part of my medical degree um, studying in one university in Bristol in the UK. Uh, and then the second part, I, I was in Cambridge University where I was doing my clinical training on the wards and also a PhD in a lab. And in my late 20s, uh, by this time, I would retired from ballroom dancing um, some years ago, because I'd sort of run out of time to do it. And in my late 20s, uh, I suddenly had this realization that I don't have to do the medical career if I don't want to. And I'd realized for a long time that I wasn't that comfortable. I didn't really see myself in it. I wasn't that happy about it. I didn't really know I didn't have a desire to do something else. I just didn't feel like I fit. I didn't feel it was me. I didn't, I didn't see a career ahead of me that I was excited by. But it was not until my late 20s that I really had the sort of self-awareness to, to say, you know, hang on, you know, all, even though everyone around you is on this same kind of treadmill, you know, the, the, the path that you go on in medicine, you can choose to do something different if you want to. And if you're going to do that, don't wait until you're in your mid thirties or mid forties to realize where it might be very difficult to then change career. So I actually decided when I left medical school at the age of 28 to not go and practice in my first job in a hospital. And I, instead I went into consulting and business. So the, the kind of business track of my career started in my late twenties. I, I was in strategy consulting for about 10 years. Um, and then I moved into the world of retail 
so I got a job in global specialist mother and baby retailer called Mother Care, which many years ago was in Australia actually, um, but but not in not in more recent years. And then I spent a time working for a luxury retail group called Selfridges Group, who owns the Selfridges department store in Oxford Street in in London and also other luxury. Uh, department store retailers around the world. The ballroom dancing story I picked up again actually in my first job in consulting. Um, so I, I hadn't been doing it for a few years, probably five or six years, hadn't done it at all. And I, I got a phone call at my desk and the girl said, a girl was on the other end of the phone and she said, um, uh, I'm looking for a partner for a competition. And it was a little bit, we'll talk later about Strictly Ballroom, but it was a little bit of, of the sort of Strictly Ballroom moment. Um, and uh, I, I was like, well, I'm not doing anything at the moment. You know, why not dig out my ballroom dancing shoes and see if I can remember how to do the steps and whatever. And we went and did this little competition for fun and enjoyed it. And it sort of picked up from there. We went and had a lesson, went to practice, and it sort of built and built and built. Um, and that was in 2005. We've been married for 12 years. Um, and our career took <laughs> us to amateur competitions, professional competitions, we turned professional and we ended up traveling the world. Uh, we competed in 14 different countries around the world. Uh, and wow. we represented England seven times at World and European <laughs> Championships in, in professional. Ended up in uh, our last competition. We came eighth in the World Championships. And it all sparked from this first conversation. Um, and That's so wonderful. The, the thing that relates, yeah, the thing that relates through to my coaching now is I work with a lot of people who are, ambitious so i work particularly with people who are high performers or high potential um and they're often stuck on um i don't know that this is possible to make this work or people around me say you're taking on too much or you know you should you should moderate your goals um for something that's more achievable uh, and i spent many years um pursuing you know high powered career in, in big, big roles and at the same time trying to run this sort of international ballroom dancing career um, and I think that if you want it enough um, and you're prepared to make significant compromises on the other things that are not part of your journey then you can then you can make it work um, so I, I, I think I bring I brought through to my leadership style when I was in senior leadership positions probably more from the ballroom dancing world and that sort of sports mm. culture than particularly what I'd learned from a sort of traditional business leadership model. <laughs> well, if, um, if we have any um, film directors listening, then uh, Gary's life story certainly sounds like a movie <laughs> uh, because it's <laughs> honestly, your story is so cool. <laughs> I love it. It's um, but in all seriousness, uh, there's a bunch of way. I love that you do your podcast about remarkable moments. Be you hearing a story. I, I, I'm going to guess that you did out of medical school would be in the extremes of a low. Would spend that time and then courageous enough. Actually, now I'm going to pivot and do this. Can I guess I'm using your format? Because I love that. Do you remember the remarkable moment <laughs> when you, um, do you remember the moment, like when, when did you have that aha moment to go, you know what, I'm in my eighth, seventh year, whenever it was, I'm not going to go and do medicine, even though I've invested all these years. You know, can, you, can you walk us through that moment where you made that call? Yeah, I can. I can. And it's interesting. I, I, I have more clarity looking back probably than I did at the time. And, and that's partly because, of some of the work I've done since then on understanding my strengths. So I, I do a lot of work with the Gallup Clifton Strengths uh, Leadership Assessment. Um, and so I understand now more why I felt like I was a square peg in a round hole. At the time, I just felt I was a square peg in a round hole, but not particularly, I couldn't diagnose it. Mm. When I talk about remarkable moments of clarity with, with people in coaching and on the podcast, what I find one of the keys to it is the moment the moment I'm interested in is the moment when you know, which is not necessarily the same as the moment when you take action. And sometimes those two are separated by in a short period of time, but sometimes those yeah. those two elements can be separated by even years. 
Mm. So the time I knew, I was in a lab. Uh, so I was in a science lab in um, Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge, which is a uh, it's a tertiary referral centre. So it's a big specialist centre um, in 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 England. And uh, I was working in a lab. I was a medical student in my sort of clinical ward training, but other scientists around me, some were pure scientists and some were doctors who'd be qualified for five or seven years and were coming back into the lab to do a PhD to advance their journey to consultant post. So there was a moment where one of the, it was a, a respiratory medicine lab and one of the respiratory consultants in the hospital was retiring. Um, and, and in any specialty in medicine, at the top of the pyramid, there aren't many people um, who are, you know, at the top of the tree. So you, you might have 20 consultant posts in the country, um, but 200 people at the level below who are at some point trying to get one of those posts. So there's kind of, it's an, it's an impossible kind of formula that you're trying to, to close out. So here you had a consultant, you know, senior consultant who'd been working in that hospital for many years retiring. And there were at least two, probably three or four of the doctors in my lab who all were qualified enough and capable enough to take up that role. Um, but only one of them did, you know, only one of them was able to, because there was obviously only one post. And so I talked to, you know, the one, the one that got the role was, was the best candidate and that was great. And everyone else was pleased for them. And I talked to one of the other uh, candidates and I said, um, so what are you going to do now that you haven't got this role? And he said, well, it's difficult because um, if I, 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 I could either wait for the next consultant to retire, but that might be five to 10 years away, or I could move to a different part of the country, but that's moving my children out of school. And, you know, my, my partner has to, has to change jobs and, and all of that. Or I have to retrain in a different specialty where there's a consultant post coming more quickly, but that means taking a step back five years in my career. And I suddenly realized that, and I had no visibility of this element of the medical career before, um, that if, if you're good enough, you still can't get the role that you want because of this pyramid structure. Um, and I had this sort of really clear moment of thinking, the one, one, one thing that's really important to me is that I have control over my career, that I'm not in, I'm not limited by the availability of opportunities if I'm good enough and ready to do the role. And so I, I started to think, well, what are my options? I had no idea that in my case, consulting, management consulting, strategy consulting was a thing. I, you know, you didn't come across that in medical school. And uh, so I started to look into it and I, and I realized that here, you know, in the business world, if you can build a long-term career in a company, that's great. But if you don't like it, you can leave and you can move into a different company or you can change sector or you can change career. Transferable skills are pretty important. Um, medicine's not like that at all. And I thought, wow, more than anything else, I want to control. I want the ability to say to quit i want the ability to mm. change if i want to yeah and that's what these doctors around me were not able to do when, when they you know they they've been probably training and practicing for 10 15 years at that point and they felt stuck um and 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 they couldn't control it now that, that was the wow <clears throat> and um thank you so much for sharing it that's i can i can really imagine being in your shoes and having that relation that's so scary as well it's uh, it's that's why it's, i think it's so courageous that you took the move that you did um now you mentioned strengths some listeners may not be familiar with it so i'd encourage everyone to go if you're not familiar with strengths finder to go and um and look into it because i'm also a very i, I love strengths finder can you just for those who do know strengths finder and maybe as an introduction or as an aside for those who don't know what are your top five um or and, and shot how did that affect that decision in hindsight so my top five strengths are maximizer so that's my number one which is a strength around i'm interested if it's good and it can become world class and you hear that in my business career in my ballroom dancing professional ballroom dancing career and also in the kind of people that i like to work with as a coach is people 
um, who are great at what they do and want to become really exceptional. Um, I have Activator, uh, which is a strength about getting started. I'm not so much the complete finisher, so I need to partner with other people to, for complete finishes. So when I was writing my book, for example, I wrote it end to end in about 42 days, I think. I have a spreadsheet somewhere. Um, but I needed to partner with an editor and a publisher to get it from my sort of scribbles that needed a huge amount of editing through to the final thing. Um, I have uh, Futuristic, where I'm very much you know, focused on a vision of the future that I'm aiming for. I have Responsibility, uh, which is something about feeling this sort of need to make a difference to people. Uh, and I also have strategic, which is something about um, taking complexity and uh, simplifying it down into two or three very clear and clean options. So, you know, I, I mm. like to simplify decisions and clarify down decisions. I think th the thing that came through in my Clifton Strengths in medicine, I've, I've written an article about this actually, um, what I didn't, I didn't appreciate this when when I was first going into medicine, that really medicine is a career. I, I thought, you know, it's a career about helping people. I imagined being a doctor on a ward, you know, diagnosing patients and so on. What I didn't appreciate really was the degree to which it is a subject that is about acquisition of knowledge. Um, and I don't particularly have a strength. I know this now, but I didn't know then. I don't have a strength of acquiring knowledge, processing huge amounts of information in detail. I'm more somebody who yeah. takes a complex situation and dramatically simplifies it. So I was writing this <laughs> article for Forbes, um, and mm. you, you can you can look at you can look it up. Um, it's about something about um, asking a great question is as important mm. as having all the answers. And, and one of the pieces of data that I picked up for that article was how many new words do you learn in a medical degree? And I was blown away. It's 15,000. You learn 15,000 new words in a medical degree, which for the five years oh of the course, of the core course, is 10 new words a day. And <laughs> I tell you, it felt like 10 new words a day. And for me, not <laughs> a learning new words, acquiring new knowledge, you know, being able to quote back the textbook kind of person. I felt, you know, I mean, I, I, I did very well at school and I felt like I was drowning sometimes in medical school with this sort of, fire hose of of information and data and fact thrown at you when i look back that's why i think more than anything else i just felt like it wasn't me i was surrounded by people who loved acquiring processing regurgitating information mm. data you know which chromosome is the gene for this disease on and you know what percentage of the population has it and what are the 17 different um, differential diagnoses if they've got this symptom and and you know I, I just felt it was a struggle and it felt quite divorced from what I was really in medicine to do which was to make a difference to people um, so I think that that's that's really where the square peg round hole thing came in yeah that's I, I love how you said that you that you you aren't, aren't necessarily suited to a these massive amounts of knowledge and then just being able to pull pieces of knowledge out you're actually really, really perfectly suited to a complex situation and dramatically simplify what's happening there which yeah. um is yeah that's that's such an articulate way to to, uh, to differentiate that i i want to ask you another mind is boring dancing you mentioned link between ballroom dancing and uh, team I imagine and leadership so so what are the biggest leadership lessons you've learned from professional and all ballroom dancing that you feel like have been you've been able to apply in coaching but also as a leader yourself so so I'll tell you a story um a particular story that I that I talk to leaders all the time about so so we spent the last part of our career um, we we were based in the UK, trained in the UK ourselves, um, but we joined uh, an elite ballroom dancing, professional ballroom dancing academy in Italy, where um, a lot of the world champions uh, were based and they trained there. And we would travel out there once a month. So whilst I was doing a full-time job, we would take Monday and a Tuesday off at, at once a month and we 
you know, we we forgot the idea of a Christmas holiday or a summer holiday or something. We put all of our annual leave into this two, two days a month. And we went to learn. Um, so the, the, the academy was run by a Russian and an Italian couple, uh, you know, um, married to one another. Um, and when I describe it to people, I say, imagine you were a long distance runner and you went to Kenya or Ethiopia to train in their environment. You know, so it's a stripped back environment. Um, there's no distractions. It's really intense. And you're in the room with a load of people that make you feel like you're, you're, you've got so much more to learn. They're so much better than you. Um, and we were having a lesson with Davide, who was the, who was at the principal of the school. And he said, the biggest mistake that ballroom dancers in my school and, and other schools make is they look at the world champion um, and they try to be like them because they say, well, they're the world champion. If I could only dance like that, then I too would be the world champion. And he said, well, it depends on who you are, because if you're, for example, a tall couple, then the way that you're going to look good is by moving fast across the floor um, with this great sort of posture and shape and, you know, you know, big sort of elbow to elbow with that sort of volume you create. If you're a small couple, then you're going to create impact by by turning fast and jumping or whatever it is, you know, it's like different types of moves. And he said, as soon as you try to be like that other person, that's not you. And years later, I came back to strengths. And of course, there's this principle in strengths that says, like pebbles on a beach, we're all distinctive. So the chance, you know, I, I talked about my top five strengths, the chance of me meeting somebody else with the same top five strengths as me is one in 250,000. The chance of me meeting somebody else with their same top five strengths in the same order that I have them is one in 33 million. So I talk to leaders now and I say, you know, <laughs> what are you trying to be? And they'll say, oh, oh, you know, the chair of the board is really good at diplomacy or, <laughs> you know, my boss is really good at commanding people or this person's really good at sort of listening and learning to people. And I say, well, but what are you good at? Oh, I don't know but I, I'm trying to be more like a diplomat or trying to command people. And I say to them, well, but you're not them and they're not you. So for sure, watch and listen and learn, but don't try to be them because you don't have their makeup in the same way as, you know, if I'm a tall ballroom dancing couple and the world champion mm. is a short, whizzy, spinny couple, I shouldn't try mm. and do, you know, the, their kind of dancing. And, and it really stuck with me because I, at the time that I got given that message, I'd probably been training as a ballroom dancer in total for about 30 years. And it felt like a revelation. And I felt like such an idiot that I hadn't figured that out for myself. But of course, I sat there going, absolutely, I've been watching the world champion. And why wouldn't I go? <laughs> They're so much better than me. I'm going to copy them. Um, mm. And what happened in our ballroom dancing was we started to develop our own style you know we were never at the top top mm. level um in in the world but suddenly things started to click when we said well what's right for us you know our physique our energy our um you know our our, our particular talents what what we want to achieve with that dancing what impact we want to have on people and so the the, the idea mindset which is this journey of taking yourself through a process of um figuring out who you are what's important to you, where you're going to go, how you're going to get there. There's a big part of it at the end. I'm mean, actually today, I'm going to have a coaching session with a senior mm. executive who's, who's just done the last stage. And he said, it was so interesting because in the last stage, I mm. say, how do you want other people to observe the change journey that you're going on? And I said, you know, when we were in a ballroom dancing competition, the judges around the side of the floor are watching us as dancers. And they won't see us change from week to week. And they will have an opinion of who we are because they've seen us for a long time. So if we want to change their opinion of who we are and act differently towards us, in our case, mark us through the next round, where last week they didn't mark us through the next round, we've got to do something strikingly different so they notice. So this idea that as a leader, if you want people around you to start treating you differently, to promote you, to give you opportunities to allow you to speak in the conversation, 
you've got to not only change yourself, but you've got to do something so striking that you change what's in the head of the people around you so that they mm. also change the opportunities they give you, the way they introduce you in the conversation, whatever it is. So there's a, there's a lot about how you not only change yourself, but how you really change the environment that, that you're working in. Yeah, I love that's a wonderful thought just on itself. The it's worth thinking about not but only the change that you want to make, but how you stepping in that will be perceived. I think that's a wonderful lens. Um, for listeners who are feeling uh, maybe challenged in the best way, thinking, thinking oh, yeah, yeah, I have been watching boring in my own world. Yeah. You know, I've been watching my leader, my, my CEO, CEO, my my auntie, you know, whoever it is that we have been modeling ourselves off and go, actually, what if, what if I'm, how, what would be the one way you recommend someone who feels like they haven't really done much of a journey, how to articulate who they are? Anything you'd recommend as a starting point? So when I'm starting to work with, with people that I'm coaching, um, and, you know, if you buy the Idea Mindset book in chapter one, you'll see these three exercises that I have people do. So the first one is to discover what your natural talents and strengths are. And there's a couple of ways you can do that. So you can you can do a formal assessment. So you can do you can go online, you can go to the Gallup website and you can buy a copy of the Gallup Clifton Strengths Assessment. It takes about an hour. You know, it, it's something you have to pay for. Um, it's, it's not hugely expensive, but you do have to pay for it. Or you can just sort of think through about situations where you're at your best. So is that a situation where you're surrounded by people or when you're on your own? Is that a situation where you're being very analytical or you're being very creative? Is that a situation where you're handling something very complex or you're simplifying it down to something very focused? So think a little bit about where am I really at my best? The second one is getting feedback from other people. So I tell people to find three people that know them really well and have seen them at their best. Maybe people they work with, maybe people in their personal life, maybe their partner or a friend, um, maybe people senior to them and at their level and maybe junior to them. And ask them some questions about, well, you know, what do you observe of me? Um, not so much the criticisms, not so much the weaknesses. Focus on where do you think I'm at my best? How do you think I handle situations well? What environment would you design for me to, to, to really bring my best through? So that's a, that's a second, getting, getting that sort of independent third party view. And then the third one is to really focus on what your needs are. So I have, I'll have a little exercise in the book called The Golden Spiral of Needs, but it's really a, a way of just saying, we we go through life with this massive long list of things we're always trying to fix, um, which is okay. But often if you've got a list of 10 or 20 things that you're trying to work on, in the end, none of them really get done to a great effect. So I say to people, if you could pick just one thing, maybe two, possibly three, that if, you, if that's the only thing that changed, it would really transform things. So for example, it might be, um, I want to have more confidence when I'm presenting in a group of people, or I want to get my work-life balance more sorted so that I've got better compartmentalization between work and home. Or it might be I've got a skill like, I don't know, financial analysis that I really want to get better at over the course of the next year. And write down what those things are. Once you have an idea of what your strengths are, how people perceive you, and really what the small number of things that you really want to make a difference on are, from there, it's so much easier to start to make progress. So I think that foundation step is is the most critical mm. one. Uh, and I spent the most time with, with people probably on that bit before you get into, so where do you want to go? Yeah. How are you going to get there? What steps are you going to take? And all that, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I love that. Because that little a revelation at that point can be like a, a little change in the rudder that doesn't seem can, but can can actually like for you that revelation about uh, needing to 
being able to change, move and quit. And, and you're running, knowing that you could, if I'm not happy here, I can easily, you know, go and pursue something else. Um, that little change in our led to obviously a big change in what you've ended up doing in your life. I'll tell you a story. Um, so mm. one of my first ever coaching clients with with the idea mindset journey, um, and he's he's my my first podcast guest. So if you find the Unlock Moment podcast and listen to episode number one, Samuel Horton, he's an actor, um, and you know he's a good actor. He's not he's not high profile. He's not famous. He's not super successful. Like it, he's not like an A list actor. He's a theatre actor in the UK. Um, and he talks about his journey where he was thinking about his needs and what he realized, and this took him a long time of reflection, actually. And it's important to say, you know, that some of the answers to these questions don't come immediately. Sometimes you have to sit with them for a long time. But he, what he realized was that he felt like he wanted and he needed success. And he realized that that was societal expectations around him saying, you well, if you're an actor and you're in this scale of production, well, you should be in the next level up. You should be in a international tour. You should be in a UK tour. You should be in the ensemble. Now you should be in an understudy. Now you should be in a lead role and you should win an award. That's how you progress in your career. Um, and he felt under pressure to do that. And what he realized after reflection, and it sounds simple, but it really wasn't, was that when he thought that his goal was success, actually his goal was happiness and how he got happiness was by achieving success but it didn't need to be and that was the revelation and so what changed was he started when he was faced with a choice in his career he started to say well which one makes me happier instead of which one makes me more successful and then hopefully i'll become happier and he started to make different choices when he was faced with a pivot point in the road so that would that was a big revelatory moment for him what was interesting and, and this revelation came for him two three years ago his career has been so much more successful since he let go of chasing success as a primary goal so at that time he was just into the ensemble of um the touring international touring cast of school of rock and he's now um, in the UK touring cast, which is the next stage up. And he's just been understudying one of the lead roles and playing the lead role sometimes in these big theatres in the UK. And I said to him, do you think you would be here in these roles if you'd been chasing the success? And he said no, because he would have got so stuck on the pressure of trying to achieve it and being knocked down when he, he didn't get the position, didn't get through the audition. And I see this so much with leaders that there's this whole perception of who you should be, how you should lead, what you should achieve. And for some people, the realization of, well, is it success? Is it money? Is it power? Is it happiness? What am I really chasing will help bring you clarity that will help you find the path that is right for you. And it's not necessarily the one that's right for the people that are advising you. They might have a different mm -hmm. path that they're going on. So good. Uh, uh, what a great... Um, as we as we start wrapping up, Gary, I'm I'm loving this so much. It's been so hear a bit of your story. And uh as I mentioned before we started recording, I'd love to invite you back for another episode at some point because I feel like we've just hit the tip of the iceberg with a bunch of different things we can talk about. But, <laughs> but the invitation is there. Uh but I do want to uh Good honor the time. So let, let me jump into um a few questions. The first one I'd love for you to tell us. Because as you said, it's really it's relevant relevant for some of the things you've talked about just then. Um, and then I'd love to know another book or books that you've gifted to other people. You've recommended a lot to other people. So, so my book is called The Idea Mindset. Uh, figure out what you want from work and how to get it in six weeks. Um, and it's a summation of my coaching program. IDEA in the Idea Mindset is an acronym. It stands for Identity, Direction, engagement and authenticity so it's about figuring out who you are and where you're going for a future that you love and that connects deeply with your values and purpose and it's a book of exercises actually so there's a lot of information and ideas and inspiration but actually it's a self-study workbook so there's six chapters and you go through and you do an exercise on what are my strengths you 
do an exercise on getting feedback from people. You do an exercise on thinking about what your needs are. And then you go through vision and objectives and action plan, physical wellness, mental resilience, how you tell your story to others, all these kind of elements of that journey. It's available in physical book, ebook, and audiobook formats. We've just released it in uh, print on demand. So uh, in, in places like Australia, you should be able to get a physical copy now from, from Amazon, as well as uh, ebook and audiobook. Um, a book that I recommend to other people is actually, I, I recommend the title to other people. Um, and then I say, if you want to read the book as well, that's probably amazing too. But just remember the title, particularly for leaders. And it's Marshall Goldsmith's book, what got you here won't get you there. And I can't, I can't remember how many times in coaching sessions I've said to people, when you're getting stuck in how to take on a new role, how to prepare for a new role, think about what got you here won't get you there. As a senior leader, you, you can't be the person that is doing all the doing anymore. The reason you got promoted to that role is absolutely because you were great at your previous role, but also <laughs> because people saw that you could be something else in the future so 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 that title is one that i say to people you know just remember the title the book is full of how you do that it's an amazing book um but don't forget the title and that's marshall goldsmith's book yeah that's wonderful um here's another question for you what's one habit that if you had to pick a habit for a leader listening you would that that can make a big difference a positive habit for a leader um, in their life and in their leadership what comes to mind? What would be one of the habits? A pretty good one. So this is this is very interesting for me because I'm not very I'm not a very habit person. So I think I, I I sit in solidarity with people who who feel like they don't have enough and and they need to make more. I think one that I would I think well, well two that I would say they're kind of linked. One is um, get organized. So so for people that that come from a sort of not a very habit-based life, and I'm absolutely one of those. Everything that I can do to just take chaos and and organize it more, not perfectly, but just a bit better, um, is 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 a really positive move. And a great way to help you do that, again, and this is my strategic coming through this sort of simplification. I've started to try and construct things into threes, and um, so I say, you know when I'm trying to go for this goal, what are the three things that are going to get me there? And it just helps me get this organization and focus to what I'm doing. So it's less a sort of laundry list of a long list of different things that I'm trying to do all the time. Mm, I love that. That's great. Uh, what about, uh, what's one thing that from your coaching, you think a lot of people could stop? Is there something that comes up a lot where, you, where people end up having a revelation and go, maybe I need to stop doing that? Maybe it's stop doing, doing that thing, stop that to myself, stop, stop saying that to myself, stop that as part of my leadership. What's one thing that um, people to become a better leader? That's a great question. I think it's a very personal question um, because it kind of depends on the individual. Um, but stopping things, there's a section in my book where I say, before you even think about how you're going to start the new things you're going to do, the new habits and new activities and new objectives, you've got to stop a lot of things. Um, so I talk about how you stop things. And I, and I talk about you've got to create some space in your diary. Um, and and you, it might be, for example, things that you, you've identified what's really important for you to change. So go through and think, what are things that are not you know, my sort of critical activities of daily life and are not serving the needs that I just said are the really important things to me. And, and if it's not on that list, then can you stop it? Uh, or can you delegate it? Or can you reduce the amount of time it takes? Uh, a lot of people, a lot of organizations, they are overwhelmed with email, they're overwhelmed mm -hmm. with meetings. So, you know, can you make the meetings shorter? Can you have fewer people in the meetings? Can you attend only part of the meeting? With email, there's some really interesting research that Bain did, actually, where they got the executive team of an organization to reduce the volume of email that they sent by applying some simple rules. And they said, rule one is don't use email if you don't need to. If you can pick up the phone, pick up the phone instead, because it doesn't generate all this sort of ongoing activity. Um, only CC people if they really need to know. 
and only reply to an email if it really needs a reply. So don't reply to say thanks, um, only reply if there's information needing to be transferred. The executive team applied those rules and it halved the volume of email that they sent out. And then they looked at the rest of the organization who hadn't been given any instruction to do anything different. And what they found was the rest of the organization also halved the volume of email they were handling, just because six people around the top table changed their behaviors. So there are simple things that you can <laughs> do that dramatically clear your diary and, and, and create time. So then I say, wow. when you've created that time, protect it, shore it up. I say protect it as if it were a kitten. Um, because it's so easy when you've created half a day on Friday afternoon now to do some good thinking that a load of other things just drop in and, and fill up that time. So switch your phone off, get out of the office, you know, tell people that you're unavailable just to keep that time that you've created to do the new thinking, to do the new activity, to implement the new habits that you, that you plan. So that protection of time is just mm. as important as the stopping of activity that, 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 that clears it out. Yeah, love it. Uh, maybe a TV show that really influenced impact on you. Well, it'll sound like a cliche, but it isn't really. Um, I love Strictly Ballroom, um, the the Baz Luhrmann uh, movie. I, I mean, as as so many people in the ballroom world do. Um, I, I was talking earlier that that you know we knew a lot of the um, amateur and professional Australian ballroom dancers. Um, and one of our very good friends, her mum is an extra in, in, in the movie, or they recognize their studios or their trophies, um, or even some of the people that, that they were around in the ballroom dancing world are kind of parodied in the movie. But there's actually an important leadership message. And it's the one we were talking about earlier, which is, you know, you think about the leader you want to be. And for sure, you know, be inspired by others, learn from others. But ultimately, it's about being the leader that, that you, you want to be. And that is the core message of, of, of Strictly Ballroom, Scott Hastings as a, as a dancer, you know, convention and, and society and, and everybody around was telling him how he was supposed to dance and he wanted to dance a different way. And of course, the fulfillment of the movie is that he chooses not to uh, win the competition by acting to convention and, and dancing his own way you know so that is that is ultimately that same message and i think it's articulated really beautifully in in strictly mm. wonderful recommendation uh, last question if you could only give one piece of advice nice. young leader what would you say that's a great question something i say to people uh all the time so i have so many people they say i've got these big ambitions um, I've got these things that I want to do. I don't have time. I don't have headspace. I can't cut through. I'm so overwhelmed with everything that's going on. So, so I, I came up with this little thing, which, which I wrote about where I say, if you have time to make only one step forward, make it a big one. So don't worry about having loads of free time because you won't. Don't worry about things calming down and becoming easier because they probably won't not with the way things are at the, at the moment in in life in the world and, and and business but maximize the time that you do have so if you if you're going to do one thing make it something that is focused on your biggest goal uh, make it something that really cuts through um, and I, I think that's that's a message that helps people to get started and get going with their most important moves yeah, I love that. Uh, it's a wonderful thought and and really encouraging and, and a great lens. I always love a good filter. You know, there's so much going on and that is a wonderful question for people out there to potentially sit down with a notebook and ask yourself that. And I think um, that's a great place to start if, if people this to, uh, to make a, a, some sort of move. Maybe some people listening with you to this point and now just writing you know being scribbling notes furiously and uh how can people connect with you find you and, and can you just remind us of your podcast and your book so people can find gary for sure so i have my my personal coaching website is garycrotaz.com um uh, and crotaz spelled c-r-o-t-a-z 
Uh, the book is The Idea Mindset. There's a little website, uh, theideamindset.com, which contains links to where you can buy it, but it's available on Amazon and Audible and, and all major platforms like that. And then the podcast is called The Unlock Moment. Uh, and again, there's a website, theunlockmoment.com. It's available also on YouTube. It's available on all of the major podcast platforms. I published my 25th interview yesterday, and it's it's a really interesting mix of people, mm. some celebrities, some dancers, some senior leaders uh, as well, talking about leadership lessons too. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. What a fun episode. Um, some great and great wisdom as well. Don't forget, I also have the John O. White Leadership Podcast and the Leadership Question of the Day Podcast. Are there two other places you can go to invest in your leadership? But I want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to you, Gary, for being so generous with your time. And as I said, for sharing great stories, it's really yeah. some of those moments from your life. And uh, yeah, it's been a joy to, to spend time with you. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Jono, thanks so much. I've, I've really enjoyed our time. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage, consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders and, you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this, I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John O. White, or clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even if You Hate Conflict. 
I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. Uh, 95% of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.